Chapter 5. West Indian Politeness, Negro Morals and Felicity, Island of St. Vincent, Grenada, the Harbour, Disappearance of the Whites, An Island of Black Freeholders, Tobago, Dramatic Art, A Promising Incident, West Indian civilization is old-fashioned and has none of the pushing manners which belong to younger and perhaps more thriving communities. The West Indians themselves, though they may be deficient in energy, are uniformly ladies and gentlemen, and all their arrangements take their complexion from the general tone of society. There is a refinement visible at once in the subsidiary vessels of the mail service which ply among the islands. They are almost as large as those which cross the Atlantic, and never on any line in the world have I met with officers so courteous and cultivated. The cabins were spacious, and as cool as a temperature of 80 degrees, gradually rising as we went south would permit. Punkas waved over us at dinner. In our berths, a single sheet was all that was provided for us, and this was one more than we needed. A sea was running when we cleared out from under the land, among the cabin passengers was a coloured family in good circumstances, moving about with nurses and children. The little things, who had never been at sea before, sat on the floor, staring out of their large, helpless black eyes, not knowing what was the matter with them. Forward, there were perhaps two or three hundred coloured people going from one island to another, singing, dancing and chattering all night long, as radiant and happy as carelessness and content could make them. Sick or not sick made no difference. Nothing could disturb the imperturbable good humour and good spirits. It was too hot to sleep. We sat several of us smoking on deck, and I learnt the first authentic particulars of the present manner of life of these much misunderstood people. Evidently they belonged to a race far inferior to the Zulus and Kafris, whom I had known in South Africa. They were more coarsely formed in limb and feature. They would have been slaves in their own country, if they had not been brought to ours, and at the worst had lost nothing by the change. They were good-natured, innocent, harmless, lazy perhaps, but not more lazy than is perfectly natural, when even Europeans must be roused to activity by cocktail. In the Antilles generally, Barbados being the only exception, Negro families have each their cabin, their garden ground, their grazing for a cow. They live surrounded by most of the fruits which grew in Adam's paradise. Oranges and plantains, breadfruit and coconuts, though not apples. Their yams and cassava grow without effort, for the soil is easily worked and inexhaustibly fertile. The curse is taken off from nature, and like Adam again, they are under the covenant of innocence. Morals in the technical sense they have none, but they cannot be said to sin, because they have no knowledge of a law, and therefore they can commit no breach of the law. They are naked and not ashamed. They are married, as they call it, but not parsoned. The woman prefers a looser tie that she may be able to leave a man if he treats her unkindly. Yet, they are not licentious. I never saw an immodest look in one their faces, and never heard of any venal profligacy. The system is strange, but it answers. A missionary told me that a connection rarely turns out well which begins with a legal marriage. The children scramble up anyhow and shift for themselves like chickens as soon as they are able to peck. Many die in this way by eating unwholesome food, but also many live, and those who do live grow up exactly like their parents. It is a very peculiar state of things, not to be understood as priest and missionary agree, without long acquaintance. There is immorality, but an immorality which is not demoralizing. There is sin, but it is the sin of animals without shame, because there is no sense of doing wrong. They eat the forbidden fruit, but it brings with it no knowledge of the difference between good and evil. They steal, but as a tradition of the time when they were themselves chattels, and the laws of property did not apply to them. They are honest about money, more honest perhaps than a good many whites. But food or articles of use they take freely, as they were allowed to do when slaves, in pure innocence of heart. In fact, these poor children of darkness have escaped the consequences of the fall, and must come of another stock after all. Meanwhile they are perfectly happy. In no part of the globe is there any peasantry whose every want is so completely satisfied as Her Majesty's black subjects in these West Indian islands. They have no aspirations to make them restless. They have no guilt upon their consciences. They have food for the picking up, clothes they need not, and lodging in such a climate need not be elaborate. 
they have perfect liberty and are safe from dangers, to which if left to themselves they would be exposed, for the English rule prevents the strong from oppressing the weak. In their own country, they would have remained slaves to more warlike races. In the West Indies, their fathers underwent a bondage of a century or two, lighter at its worst than the easiest form of it in Africa. Their descendants in return have nothing now to do save to laugh and sing and enjoy existence. Their quarrels, if they have any, begin and end in words. If happiness is the be-all and end all of life, and those who have most of it have most completely attained the object of their being, the nigger, who now basks among the ruins of the West Indian plantations, is the supremest specimen of present humanity. We retired to our berths at last. At waking we were at anchor off St. Vincent, an island of volcanic mountains robed in forest from shore to crest. Till late in the last century it was the headquarters of the Caribs, who kept up a savage independence there, recruited by runaway slaves from Barbados or elsewhere. Brandy and Sir Ralph Abercrombie reduced them to obedience in 1796, and St. Vincent throve tolerably down to the days of free trade. Even now when I saw it, Kingston, the principal town, looked pretty and well-to-do, reminding me, strange to say, of towns in Norway, the houses stretching along the shore painted in the same tints of blue or yellow or pink, with the same red-tiled roofs, the trees coming down the hillsides to the water's edge, villas of modest pretensions shining through the foliage, with the patches of cane fields, the equivalent in the landscape of the brilliant Norwegian grass. The prosperity has for the last forty years waned and waned. There are now two thousand white people there, and forty thousand coloured people, and proportions alter annually to our disadvantage. The usual remedies have been tried. The constitution has been altered a dozen times. Just now I believe the Crown is trying to do without one, having found the results of the elective principle not encouraging, but we shall perhaps revert to it before long. Anyway, the tables show that each year the trade of the island decreases, and will continue to decrease, while the expenditure increases and will increase. I did not land, for the time was short, and as a beautiful picture, the island was best seen from the deck. The characteristics of the people are the same in all the Antilles, and could be studied elsewhere. The bustle and confusion in the ship, the crowd of boats round the ladder, the clamour of Negro men's tongues, and the blaze of colours from the Negro women's dresses, made up together a scene sufficiently entertaining for the hour which we remained. In the middle of it the governor, Mr. S., came on board with another official. They were going on in the steamer to Tobago, which formed part of his dominions. Leaving St. Vincent, we were all the forenoon passing the Grenadines, a string of small islands fitting into their proper place in the Antilles semicircle. But as if nature had forgotten to put them together, or else had broken some large island to pieces and scattered them along the line. Some were large enough to have once carried sugar plantations and are now made over wholly to the blacks. Others were fishing stations, droves of whales during certain months frequenting these waters. Others were mere rocks, amidst which the white-sailed American coasting schooners were beating up against the northeast trade. There was a stiff breeze, and the sea was white with short curling waves, but we were running before it, and the wind kept the deck fresh. At Grenada, the next island, we were to go on shore. Grenada was, like St. Vincent, the home for centuries of man-eating Caribs, French for a century and a half, and finally, after many desperate struggles for it, was ceded to England at the Peace of Versailles. It is larger than St. Vincent, though in its main features it has the same character. There are lakes in the hills, and a volcanic crater not wholly quiescent, but the especial value of Grenada, which made us fight so hardly to win it, is the deep and landlocked harbour, the finest in all the Antilles. Père Labat, to whose countrymen it belonged at the time of his own visit there, says that, if Barbados had such a harbour as Grenada, it would be an island without a rival in the world. If Grenada belonged to the English, who knew how to turn to profit natural advantages, it would be a rich and powerful colony. In itself it was all that man could desire. To live there was to live in paradise. Labat found the island occupied by countrymen of his own, paysans I says, he calls them, growing their tobacco, their indigo and scarlet roku, 
their pigs and their poultry, and contented to be without sugar, without slaves, and without trade. The change of hands from which he expected so much had actually come about. Grenada did belong to the English, and had belonged to us ever since Rodney's peace. I was anxious to see how far Labatt's prophecy had been fulfilled. St. George Ness, the capital, stands on the neck of a peninsula a mile in length, which forms one side of the harbour. Of the houses, some look out to sea, some inwards upon the Cairnage, as the harbour is called. At the point there was a fort, apparently of some strength, on which the British flag was flying. We signalled that we had the governor on board, and the fort replied with a puff of smoke. Sound there was none, or next to none, but we presumed that it had come from a gun of some kind. We anchored outside. Mr. S. landed in an official boat with two flags, a missionary in another, which had only one. The crews of a dozen other boats then clambered up the gangway to dispute possession of the rest of us, shouting, swearing, lying, tearing us this way and that way, as if we were carcasses and they wild beasts wanting to dine upon us. We engaged a boat for ourselves as we supposed. We had no sooner entered it than the scandalous boatman proceeded to take in as many more passengers as it would hold. Remonstrance being vain, we settled the matter by stepping into the boat next to joining, and amidst howls and execrations we were borne triumphantly off and were pulled into the land. Labatt had not exaggerated the beauty of the landlocked basin into which we entered on rounding the point. On three sides, wooded hills rose high till they passed into mountains. On the fourth was the castle with its slopes and batteries, the church and town beyond it, and everywhere luxuriant tropical forest trees overhanging the violet-coloured water. I could well understand the Frenchman's delight when he saw it, and also the satisfaction with which he would now acknowledge that he had been a short-sighted prophet. The English had obtained Granada, and this is what they had made of it. The forts which had been erected by his countrymen had been deserted and dismantled. The castle on which we had seen our flag flying was a ruin. The walls were crumbling and in many places had fallen down. One solitary gun was left, but that was honeycombed and could be fired only with half a charge to salute with. It was true that the forts had ceased to be of use, but that was because there was nothing left to defend. The harbour is, as I said, the best in the West Indies. There was not a vessel in it, nor so much as a boatyard that I could see where a spar could be replaced, or a broken rivet mended. Once there had been a line of wharves, but the piles had been eaten by worms and the platforms had fallen through. Round us when we landed were unroofed warehouses, weed-choked courtyards, doors gone, and window frames fallen in or out. Such a scene of desolation and desertion I never saw in my life save once, a few weeks later at Jamaica. An English lady with her children had come to the landing place to meet my friends. They too were more like wandering ghosts than human beings with warm blood in them. All their thoughts were on going home, home out of so miserable an exile. Nature and the dark race had been simply allowed by us to resume possession of the island. Here where the cannon had roared and ships and armies had fought and the enterprising English had entered into occupancy, under whom, as we are proud to fancy, the waste places of the earth grow green, and industry and civilization follow as an inevitable fruit, all was now silence. And this was an English crown colony, as rich in resources as any area of soil of equal size in the world. England had demanded and seized the responsibility of managing it. This was the result. Footnotes I have been told that this picture is overdrawn, that Granada is the most prosperous of the Antilles, that its exports are increasing, that English owners are making large profits again, that the blacks are thriving beyond example, that there are twenty guns in the fort, that the wharves and quay are in perfect condition, that there are no roofless warehouses, that in my description of St. George's I must have been asleep or dreaming. I can only repeat and insist upon what I myself saw. I know very well that in parts of the island a few energetic English gentlemen are cultivating their land with remarkable success. Any enterprising Englishman with capital and intelligence might do the same. I know also that in no part of the West Indies are the blacks happier or better off, but notwithstanding the English interest in the island has sunk to relatively nothing. 
Once Englishmen owned the whole of it, now there are only 30 English estates. There are 5,000 peasant freeholds owned almost entirely by coloured men, and the effect of the change is written upon the features of the harbour. Not a vessel of any kind was to be seen in it. The great wooden jetty where cargoes used to be landed or taken on board was a wreck, the piles eaten through, the platform broken. On the quay there was no sign of life or of business, the houses along the side mean and insignificant, while several large and once important buildings, warehouses, custom houses, dwelling houses, or whatever they had been, were lying in ruins, tropical trees growing in the courtyards, and tropical creepers climbing over the masonry, showing how long the decay had been going on. These buildings had once belonged to English merchants, and were evidence of English energy and enterprise, which once had been and now had ceased to be. As to the guns in the fort, I cannot say how much old iron may be left there, but I was informed that only one gun could be fired, and that with but half a charge. This is of little consequence or none, but unless the English population can be reinforced, Grenada in another generation will cease to be English at all, while the prosperity, the progress, even the continued civilization of the blacks depends on the maintenance there of English influence and authority. Nature and the dark race had been simply allowed by us to resume possession of the island. Here, where the cannon had roared, and ships and armies had fought, and the enterprising English had entered into occupancy, under whom, as we are proud to fancy, the waste places of the earth grow green, and industry and civilization follow as an inevitable fruit, all was now silence. And this was an English crown colony, as rich in resources as any area of soil of equal size in the world. England had demanded and seized the responsibility of managing it. This was the result. A gentleman who for some purpose was a passing resident in the island had asked us to dine with him. His house was three or four miles inland. A good road remained as a legacy from other times, and a pair of horses and a phaeton carried us swiftly to his door. The town of St. George's had once been populous, and even now there seemed no want of people, if mere numbers sufficed. We passed for half a mile through a straggling street, where the houses were evidently occupied, though unconscious for many a year of paint or repair. They were squalid and dilapidated, but the luxuriant bananas and orange trees in the gardens relieved the ugliness of their appearance. The road when we left the town was overshadowed with gigantic mangoes planted long ago, with almond trees and cedar trees, no relations of our almonds or our cedars, but the most splendid ornaments of the West Indian forest. The valley up which we drove was beautiful, and the house when we reached it showed taste and culture. Mr. had rare trees, rare flowers, and was taking advantage of his temporary residence in the tropics to make experiments in horticulture. He had been brought there, I believe, by some necessities of business. He told us that Grenada was now the ideal country of modern social reformers. It had become an island of pure peasant proprietors. The settlers, who had once been a thriving and wealthy community, had almost melted away. Some thirty English estates remained which could still be cultivated, and were being cultivated with remarkable success. But the rest had sold their estates for anything which they could get. The free blacks had bought them, and about eight thousand Negro families say 40,000 black souls in all, now shared three-fourths of the soil between them. Each family lived independently, growing coffee and cocoa and oranges, and all were doing very well. The possession of property had brought a sense of its rights with it. They were as litigious as Irish peasants, everyone was at law with his neighbour, and the island was a gold mine to the Attorney General. Otherwise, they were quiet, harmless fellows, and if the politicians would only let them alone, they would be perfectly contented, and might eventually, if wisely managed, come to some good. To set up a constitution in such a place was a ridiculous mockery, and would only be another name for swindling and jobbery. Black the island was, and black it would remain. The conditions were never likely to arise which would bring back a European population. But a governor who was a sensible man, who would reside and use his natural influence, could manage it with perfect ease. The island belonged to England, we were responsible for what we made of it, and for the blacks' own sakes we ought not to try experiments upon them. They knew their own deficiencies, 
and would infinitely prefer a wise English ruler to any constitution which could be offered them. If left entirely to themselves, they would in a generation or two relapse into savages. There were but two alternatives before not Grenada only, but all the English West Indies, either an English administration pure and simple, like the East Indian, or a falling eventually into a state like that of Haiti, where they eat the babies, and no white man can own a yard of land. It was dark night when we drove back to the port. The houses along the road, which had looked so miserable on the outside, were now lighted with paraffin lamps. I could see into them, and was astonished to observe signs of comfort, and even signs of taste. Armchairs, sofas, sideboards with cut glass upon them, engravings and coloured prints upon the walls. The old state of things is gone, but a new state of things is rising, which may have a worth of its own. The plant of civilization as yet has taken but feeble root and is only beginning to grow. It may thrive yet if those who have troubled all the earth will consent for another century to take their industry elsewhere. The ship's galley was waiting at the wharf when we reached it. The captain also had been dining with a friend on shore, and we had to wait for him. The offshore night breeze had not yet risen. The harbour was smooth as a looking-glass, and the stars shone double in the sky and on the water. The silence was only broken by the whistle of the lizards or the cry of some far-off marsh frog. The air was warmer than we ever feel it in the depth of an English summer, yet pure and delicious and charged with the perfume of a thousand flowers. One felt it strange that with so beautiful a possession lying at our doors, we should have allowed it to slide out of our hands. I could say for myself, like Père Labat, the island was all that man could desire. En un mot, la vie est délicieuse. The anchor was got up immediately that we were on board. In the morning we were to find ourselves at Port of Spain. Mr. Essau, the Windward Island governor, who had joined us at St. Vincent, was, as I said, going to Tobago. Defoe took the human part of his Robinson Crusoe from the story of Juan Fernandez. The locality is supposed to have been Tobago, and Trinidad, the island from which the cannibal savages came. We are continually shuffling the cards, in a hope that a better game may be played with them. Tobago is now annexed to Trinidad. Last year it was a part of Mr. Essung's dominions, which he periodically visited. I fell in with him again on his return, and he told us an incident which befell him there, illustrating the unexpected shapes in which the schoolmaster is appearing among the blacks. An intimation was brought to him on his arrival, that as the Athenian journeyman had played Pyramus and Thisbe at the nuptials of Theseus and Hippolyta, so a party of villagers from the interior of Tobago would like to act before his excellency. Of course he consented. They came and went through their performance, to Mr. S's, and probably to the reader's astonishment, the play which they had selected was The Merchant of Venice. Of the rest of it he perhaps thought, like the Queen of the Amazons, that it was sorry stuff. But Shylock's representative, he said, showed real appreciation. With freedom and a peasant proprietary, the moneylender is a necessary phenomenon, and the actor's imagination may have been assisted by personal recollections.